us pray together. Our Father, we ask tonight simply that we would be like the prophet Samuel when he was a boy and he came before you. And all he said was, speak, Lord, your servant's listening. So we pray that would be our heart tonight. And we ask this, and you would do it in your son's name. Amen. Lord, do you not care that we are perishing? That is a question that was asked of the Lord Jesus. In fact, that question summarizes probably the most honest, raw emotion in questioning of the Lord. If you're not familiar with that question, it, the setting goes like this. It was a long day of ministry and work. Jesus and his disciples had been ministering and going about their business. It was late in the evening. And Jesus told his disciples to put him on a boat and take him across the sea. Now, this was all kinds of out of water. You know, this is late at night. This is at seafaring time. But the boys said, yes, we'll listen. So they loaded in the boat, and they began this journey. This journey, which would have normally took very little time and would have been fairly easy, took a a sudden turn for the worst. The Bible says that a, a strong storm, I think the King James calls it a tempest, descended upon them. Now, this was bad for a couple of reasons. It was bad, number one, because, again, it was late at night. These boats weren't motorboats. They weren't power vessels. They took strength and, and, and determination and focus to, to sail. Number two, these guys weren't the best swimmers. Now, you think about this. The Jewish people were not seafaring people. They would fish along the shore. But if you remember in Jonah, when Jonah wanted to flee to Tarshish, he actually had to get some Phoenicians. These were seafaring people. So these guys were not what you call hardy seamen. Third, this was more water than any of them could drink. It was, and so the the reality of the situation was if this boat capsizes, there's no life jackets, there's no Coast Guard. If this boat turns over, they will die. Secondly, going on in the boat, as you now remember the story, that Jesus had fell asleep in the stern of the boat. So while this boat was was threatening again in the language of Jonah to be torn apart. There Jesus is asleep, and the disciples have seen him do miracles. So they know that he can do amazing things. They know this. They also know that he isn't doing any of it. So you understand the rawness in their question, the almost sarcasm and the desperation as they appeal to the Savior, Lord, do you not care? The assumption is you don't care. You're doing nothing. You're sleeping, and we're going to die. Now, that's not the first time that, that things like that have been uttered. They've been uttered in the Old Testament as well as the New Testament. You have to go no further than back to Habakkuk, and you see in the opening of Habakkuk, he appeals to the heaven in, despite all this going around him, and he says, How long, O Lord? How long is this going to go on? So this has been something that's been asked of the Lord, Old Testament, New Testament, throughout human history. I would, I would wager to you to, tonight that a whole generation of a population became atheists for that reason. Those people that were interned in concentration camps in World War II were considered God's people they're not they were the covenant people of God and so they went to these camps certain that God would rescue them and that rescue never came and so they watched their mothers their fathers their children their brothers and sisters being burned to death gassed to death starved to death worked to death performed all kinds of monstrous procedures on them and help never came and that, therefore, spurned a whole generation 
of Jewish people who no longer believed in God. Because the question is, God, do you not care that we are perishing? That's the echo that you hear in Martha's words. You hear that when she says that. Lord, if you would have been here, our brother would not have died. See, she fell right into that same category of despair in the light of the suffering of her brother and the suffering of her family. Again, you can hear that desperation and that sarcasm. She knows who Jesus is. She knows what he can do. And yet he apparently did nothing. If you go back and read the text, Lazarus is sick. And so they send for Jesus, who is just a couple of hours away. A couple of hours. He's nowhere away. And they send for him, and you can almost imagine the message. Tell Jesus to come. The one that he has loved is sick, and he's dying. He is, he is about to leave this world. Tell him to come right now. What does Jesus do? He sits down what he does instead of going right now he sits down it doesn't go at all they know this they know how far it is and why it has taken Jesus so long they don't know so they ask the question of of Jesus or they make the the uh, assertion to Jesus if you will if you had have been here our brother wouldn't have died now, we're going to talk about tonight the hope of the gospel. Now, uh, two caveats. This is the series ending sermon for something I've been doing at Bethany. So you're coming on the tail end of this. Since January, we've been looking at why the gospel of Jesus Christ is the single most important thing in any person's life and why Christians should hold it so precious. But tonight we're going to talk about why the gospel gives hope to those that are perishing. This will account for a handful of people in here tonight. You know who you are. The rest of you filed this away because some of you are going to need it. I want you to look at the way Jesus responded to Martha and Mary. I want you to notice this. But what, you, what I want you to notice is how he does not respond. You see, when, when Jesus is questioned, he doesn't look at Martha and say, well, you know, Martha, you really shouldn't question the plan of God. You shouldn't question the Almighty in your circumstance. You should never do that. Do you know how, how, how unfaithful and blasphemous that is? Notice that never comes out of his mouth. He never says anything Close to that. Jesus understood the rawness, the emotion, the confusion, and the hurt that had come into this family's life. And so what Jesus does is he responds, and he responds three ways. First of all, he responds in a positive way. I want you to look at what he says. Jesus says to Martha, when she says, if you would have been here my brother wouldn't have died. Jesus looks at her and says, your brother will. Will. Now you think about that word will for a minute. Now notice Jesus doesn't respond to suffering the way sometimes we do. Now, either you've heard this or you've said it, but you can just imagine it. How, how do people respond to others who are suffering. Number one, they may something, say something like this. Well, you know, it's all going to work out. Really? Oh, great theologian who has a better connection to the Lord and Savior than the Apostle Paul and John the Beloved, one who knows more than all church history, would you please tell me how this is going to work out? Because you can't. Number two, how about this one? You know, God will never give you more than you can handle. Has there ever been something more unbiblical uttered than that? 
Never has anything been more unbiblically uttered. Everything that you have is more than you can handle. This is why Paul said in the book of Acts that in him we live and move and have our being. So God is notorious for heaping upon us more than we could ever handle. In fact, that's where the glory comes in, when God dumps on us more than we can handle. So when people say God will never give you more than you can handle, they neither know God or the scriptures. Number three, God has a plan for this in your life. Okay, here it is. Here's my pen. Here's a piece of paper. Write it out. If you know this, you need to explain it to the, the suffering. They want to know what it is. It's terrible to say to them, God's a plan. What is it? I don't know. Well, why'd you open your mouth? Don't open your mouth. How about this one? You know, there are always people worse off than you are. Number one, when did this become a we situation? I'm serious. When did it become a we situation? And number two, would you please find that person and go talk to them? See if you can't help them through a situation. It's, it's utter nonsense to say there are people worse off than you. Well, no, duh. There's people worse off than everybody in this building. How is that helpful in the least? It's not. Here's one just, I'm, I'm giving you this one extra, and it's not going to cost you a dime more. <laughs> I'm serious. I thought about this. This happened to me. So I was at the gym about a month and a half ago, and I, was, I had just started going back, trying to retain some muscle elasticity and things like that. And I had my Bethany T-shirt on, which I don't wear in public anymore, and I'll tell you why. I was sitting on the machine, and a woman walked up to me. And listen, I don't want to down her, but this is what she said. She said, are you the pastor of Bethany? I said, I am. She said, I heard about what happened to you. That is so terrible. My sister died of that. It is horrible. If you ever think about saying that, stomp your foot with your other foot. <laughs> I am dead serious. You can't say anything more hurtful to a person. So I want you to notice that Jesus never responds with things like that that we should never respond with. Put those things in your toolbox and never use them. Jesus looked at Martha and said, your brother will. Now you think about that word will. That word will is always dependent upon two things, desire and ability. Some things we say in terms of might, right? Because they may be out of control. We say it might rain tomorrow. Why? Because we can't handle that. We don't, it's not our ability. I, must, I also may say I might go fishing tomorrow. That may depend on whether or not I feel like going fishing and conditions are favorable. I may just not have the desire or the will to go fishing. So that's what I mean when I say I will. Like people say, I'll be to Sunday school on time. I will be there. And you're not. You understand? Do you understand what I'm getting at? So that's the problem when we say, but you think about when the sovereign of this universe says you will. It is a whole category unto itself. Remember what the Bible said, and it shall come to pass that all who call upon the Lord might be saved. You remember that verse? It says what? Shall or will. How would you imagine that you came before the Lord and said, I am calling upon the name of the Lord, and I'm praying that I might be saved. You couldn't live like that, could you? Because when the Lord says it will, it's going to happen. In fact, it is more certain then the very hair on your head is more certain than your physical being that God says, you will, you will. So God responds to this situation positively. God does not respond in the negatively. The Lord is positive in his response and is very, very promising. The second thing I want you to see in this 
is that his response gives purpose. Purpose to the suffering. Now, there is an ultimate purpose to Lazarus' suffering. But before we talk about ultimate purpose, I want to share with you about three or four purposes that are subsequent to that. Why suffering might occur. Number one, suffering may occur to draw a person unto the Savior. God may use suffering in someone's life to shake them out of lostness. Why? Because of hardness of heart. What keeps so many people from committing to the Lord? They see no need, right? The reality of hell does not scare them. If the reality of hell does not scare you, I fear what must happen to you to get saved. But it happens. People lose things. They lose the materials. They lose their their ability, they lose their health, and they come to the end of the road and say, I have nothing. And God's like, that's exactly right. You have nothing. But in me, you can have everything. So suffering can be used to bring a person into the Lord. Suffering can be used to draw a believer into close communion with God. Again, quite often, even Christians get lulled into this earthly comfort. They get lulled into the concept of, you know what, I'm saved, and I'm good, I'm going to live this life. And sometimes God has to snatch a rug out from under them, too, in order to get their attention. I like what A.W. Tozer said. He says, it is doubtful that God can bless a man deeply unless he has hurt him greatly. People who suffer in the Lord have an intimacy with the sovereign God in this universe that few people will ever understand. Number three, suffering can be a way that God chooses to pull a person out of sin. Now, let me walk carefully here. You know, what happens is in our theology, we bounce from one heresy to another. And we're always between heresies. And so it seems unbiblical to say that somebody may be suffering because they're living in sin. And what I'm saying is, is that maybe not necessarily the sin they're in is causing them to suffer, but some suffering is coming to their life. That, folks, is biblical. All you have to do is read Psalm number 6. The psalmist says, O Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger or discipline me in your wrath. And so one of the most profound questions any person can ask that's a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, not ask of somebody else, this is introspective, is ask yourself, am I suffering? Is God using this as a way to get my attention? What does the book of Hebrews say? It says that God chastises every what? Son that he loves. He chastises. And so if suffering is coming to your life or my life, we ought to ask the question, is all this going on in my life because I am in open disobedience or rebellion? It never hurts to ask that. But ultimately, suffering does something profound. I want you to understand, as you look in this text, there is a, there's a line drawn. You, you see an illustration right here, right? So you have Lazarus, who lives and untimely dies and is buried. Now, you know then the story, and he is what? Resurrected. Based upon that, Jesus makes a straight, short line to what? The fact that he is going to what? Die untimely, be buried, and on the third day, he's what? Resurrected. Suffering is a type of Christ. You see types all through the Bible, right? So you see things that picture something else. So you might say that Moses is a type of Jesus. He's portrayed that way in the New Testament. In Matthew's Gospel, when Jesus is going around preaching on the side of the mountain, that's Moses, right? You, you would say that the temple is a type, right? Maybe you studied the temple. You say how the temple is a picture of Jesus and his work. The Day of Atonement, Leviticus chapter 16, is a what? It's a beautiful picture. Who is the scapegoat? Jesus. 
suffering then becomes in the Christian's life identification with and a type of Jesus. And if you don't believe that, I want you to listen to Colossians chapter 1 and verse 24. Paul writes this. He says, I now rejoice. Rejoice in what, Paul? In my sufferings. For you, and I fell up in my flesh, was lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God, which, which was given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, the mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations and now has been revealed to his saints. To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory and the mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, what? The hope of glory. So Paul says, I, I intend to fill up in my flesh what was lacking in the afflictions of Christ. Now, what is important is to understand what Paul's not saying. Paul's not saying that his suffering fulfills what was lacking in Christ in the sense that what Christ did on the cross wasn't enough. That's one interpretation that has horribly been taken, that Christ's atonement was good, but it needs a little something. So when a Christian suffers, it adds to that saving work. There is nothing to be added to the saving work of Christ. What Paul's talking about here is that word, uh, from which we get our word martyr, which is witness. It speaks of how the suffering Christian points to a suffering Savior, right? So when Jesus did his work on the cross, it was not enough that he just died. Now, folks, we understand that death is at the center of the atonement and blood is at the center of the atonement, but go back and read Isaiah 53. He was crushed and beaten and afflicted. He suffered. If suffering was not part and parcel to the finishing work of Christ, then God slayed him unjustly. There are faster and easier and more painless ways to die, yet Christ died in the most horrific manner there could be. Suffering was part and parcel. And this is why Peter would say this in 1 Peter 2. He says, he says, for this, or for to this you were called. He's talking to Christians. He said, you were called to this because Christ offered, also suffered for us. He left us an example that you should what? Follow in his steps. You see that? Let me read that again. He said, for this you were called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps. There is this unbreakable bond, this beautiful typography in the life of a person in Christ that suffers, that they are witnessing through their struggle. The Via Della Rosa, the, the way of suffering. They are they're lending a picture to the gospel so that their suffering takes on an ultimate meaning. And this is why Jesus would say to them, Did I not tell you that if you believe you what? You would see the glory of God. So in the ultimate sense, the suffering of Lazarus pointed everyone to Jesus. And so God allows suffering in the life of his people that those people would what? Point to Jesus. And thirdly, I want you to see that suffering has an end. Now, folks, I want you to understand that when I say this, I don't say that this suffering will be easy. You know, I, I said a while back, I said, you know, I'd rather hear a preacher who sounds like a drunk porky pig who has suffered, talk about suffering, than the most verbose theologian who hasn't got a clue. I'd rather hear him because he understands it's not easy. Suffering can be physical. It has pain involved. It is emotional, and it is spiritual. 
Romans chapter 8 is, um, there's a verse in Romans chapter 8, verses that I had read through numerous times that I did not get the, the meaning of until last December. Paul says this in Romans 8 and verse 18. He says, for I consider the sufferings of this present age. I want you to understand that the context of what Paul's talking about is suffering. He's not talking about speaking in tongues, praying in tongues. This verse gets used to teach praying in tongues. That's nonsense. Nonsense. It's in the context of suffering. Paul says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which should be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly, eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God, for the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because of the creation also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption and the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs until now. Not only that, but we also have the first fruit of the spirits. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of what? Our bodies. Why? Because they're suffering. Verse 24, for we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one hope? One still hope for what he sees. But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Verse 26, likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what we should pray as we ought. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with the groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts and what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Now I read that to you because of that key verse there. Verse 26 when it says, The Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what we should pray, but the Spirit himself makes intercession with us with us with the groanings. Now let me tell you what that means. One of the one of the bad effects of ALS, I'll just talk about this one time we done, is that it attacks the part of the brain that's connected to emotion. So what might be painful for you is like somebody taking me and slamming me in the ground. And so there's been more than one occasion I found myself curled up in the floor like this. Because it's not easy. But God has a purpose and an ending. Let's move on. Now I want to draw your attention to this climax, the climax of this story. Jesus is brought to the tomb. He, he's endured the questioning of Martha and Mary. They both asked the exact same question. Where were you? What does Jesus do when he arrives? He does something that had it not been him, it would have been blasphemy. He says, roll the stone away. Now, you must understand that this would have been incredulous to the people standing around. You never open the tomb of a dead person. You never do that. It's also significant that, that, that Lazarus has been as dead as long as he has before Jesus came. See, there was a reason Jesus waited. See, in the Jewish culture, your body might die, but it takes a couple of days for your spirit to depart. That's how they viewed it, and that's why those three days were essential. And after those three days, finally a Jewish person could look at a deceased loved one and said, now he is dead, his spirit is gone. Jesus waits for So you understand their questioning. They're, they're thinking, Jesus, why do you want to open this tomb? He's dead. He's so dead that, that the, the decomposition process has started, and he's going to stink. They didn't have um, 
embalming processes like we did. Body couldn't stay out of the ground long, couldn't be around people long. So they said, Jesus, don't do this. And Jesus said, did I tell you if you believe, you see the glory of God? And so they backed up and just rolled the stone away. And what happened next is incredible. Jesus stepped into the tomb, and first of all, he prays. And he says, Father, I thank you that you always hear me. You always hear me. But for the sake of these around me, I want to show them something. That's a paraphrase. And he looks in that tomb, and he draws in the breath, and he utters out this necrotic imperative, and he says, Lazarus, come forth. I like what a preacher said about that. He said, Jesus didn't think there were five bodies in there. There was only one. There was nobody else coming out. But if Jesus hadn't called out Lazarus and said, come forth, every tomb on earth would have emptied. <laughs> he could do it, you know. <laughs> Amen. So he says, Lazarus, come forth. Jesus has healed blind people. He's healed um, lame people. He's healed people with leprosy. He's healed people with the issues of blood. But he just healed somebody right there that is good and dead. Rigor mortis has set in. They're stiff. They stink. And when Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth, his heart beat. Blood coursed through his veins. All that decomposition reversed itself. His limbs limbered up. He sat up and he walked out, and God healed him. Now, understand that in suffering, I, I believe that God heals people. I do. You know, you know I'm, I'm praying for it. And I don't know who that precious lady was at the, at the prayer meeting. If you're here, come see me. But some sweet soul was sitting in the back, and they said, I pray, God, that Brian will see his kids grow up. <laughs> Lazarus died again, didn't he? They buried him again. He went through that whole thing again because Jesus wasn't pointing ultimately to a physical healing. He is pointing to an eternal healing. What he was saying to Lazarus is this. You know, I'm going to heal that body and it's going to age. God can heal me and I'm going to age. I'm going to die. One day or another, I'm going to die. Every person that is in here that God has healed, praise God, one day that healing won't be enough. There needs to be a healing above that one. There needs to be something that goes beyond that one. And so when Jesus was saying to her is that I'm going to resurrect him now, but I want you to understand something. So that when I come out of the tomb, he says this, that he who believes in me... Verse 25. Let's read it again. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he what? May die. That's not really a may. He says, whoever believes in me is going to die. But let me tell you what. He will live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And so coupled up with the hope of suffering is the idea of trust. He looks at Mary and he looks at Martha and he says, do you believe this? Do, do you believe I can do what I say I can do? In fact, hold on, I'll show you. You watch it and then ask yourself the question, do you believe I can do what I say I can do? And when Jesus came out of that tomb, he validated all of this. And he put all suffering in its proper perspective. That all suffering seems unpleasant for a time, but is working out for you, according to the Bible, what an eternal weight of glory. And so you have this beautiful truth. 
that when the chairs sit on top of the table and somebody swoops the floor and they turn the lights out and lock the doors on your life, Jesus will take your hand. He will walk you home. Let's pray. I know folks in here tonight, I know some of you are suffering from pretty scary stuff. I can literally say I feel you. God's working out in you an eternal weight of glory. He's not forget about you. He's not turned his eye to you. He's not shown up late. God is going to glorify himself through you. There's some folks in here tonight, and I don't know who you are, and so if it happens, I didn't do it to you. You're going to suffer. You're going to. You're going to find out like I did. There is so little of your life you have control over. You have so little say-so over what happens to you. But praise be to God that we have a Savior who suffered and died so that, Lord, our suffering won't be in vain. I'm going to talk to you tonight if you're in here and you've never trusted Jesus. There is a God in heaven that loves you. He loves you more than you know. He identified with you. He suffered for you. So that any suffering you encounter wouldn't end in death, but end in the glory of God. And you're here tonight, and God is speaking to you, and you need to turn your life over to him. Be saved. Be born again. Be freed from the fear of death and suffering and know that he loves you. During this invitation, I pray that if God is speaking to you, you come down to this altar and grab baby, Brother Dave or David or Hal by the hand and give your life to him. If you're here suffering today, I want you to know that God knows where you are and he loves you. Folks, this is a God worth serving. This is a Savior worth loving with all that you have. Hold nothing back. Father God, as we go to this invitation, I pray that, Father, you would speak to your people, that you would um, call unsaved people to yourself tonight, that somebody gets saved tonight and know the glorious love of the Savior, that, Father, the, the Christians that are here tonight that are suffering through some scary stuff will be encouraged. God, I'm encouraged. I pray they will be too. They'd know you in a more intimate way tonight. Lord, I pray for the strengthening of your church. And I pray, Lord, that all of us tonight would see that the gospel truly is more than we could ever ask for. Jesus is better than we deserve or could ask for. And he is worthy of all that we have. And I pray this.